Okay, so everyone loves a good old one season wonder, but what if I told you there was one player who seemed so painfully average his national team would barely even acknowledge his existence? Who then, one season, just seemingly flipped a switch and began pulling off the kind of goal scoring numbers only Ronaldo and Messi can aspire to, leading his team to unprecedented levels of glory only to go back to normal the second that season ended, seemingly disappearing into the shadows to the point that today, just six years after his retirement, nobody seems to even remember him. It's like if Jamie Vardy had played twice as well as he did, won the title for Leicester and then gone missing the second he put down the trophy. If you haven't caught on to it just yet, the player I'm talking about is Grafite, and his career really is that similar to Vardy's in the sense that by the time he was in his early 20s, he had pretty much given up hope of ever going pro. Instead, he was working as a door-to-door -door salesman, selling heavy-duty garbage bags. Yeah, his very last bit of hope of making it in football was Matunins, a team that only played in their regional championship and somehow still managed to get relegated that year. You see, Grafita tried everything, he went on so many trials and still things never worked out for him. I actually, to be fair, he did get approved once at Paulista de Jundiaí, but I mean, come on, they're a third tier club, if even they rejected you, I guess you might as well quit. But as I was explaining, even that chance meant nothing because they asked him to stay for a few more days and Grafit simply had to say no because he had a one-year-old daughter and he just had to go back to work. Still, thankfully, at the age of 22, he found his light at the end of the tunnel, with First Division Santa Cruz coming to his rescue. But guess what? They got relegated immediately, and with five goals to his name, it didn't seem like Grafit would stand much of a chance either, but somehow Grêmio decided to sign him, though I'm pretty sure they quickly regretted it, as his time there went a bit something like this. He arrived, he got injured after one match, came back three months later and scored only three goals for the club before they sent him back to Santa Cruz, where he'd finally start putting up some numbers, scoring 11 goals in 15 games, only to watch them lose out on promotion to the top flight, losing the trust of the board once again who pretty much just told him time to learn korean buddy <laughs> and yeah that's how he went from selling garbage bags to playing in south korea in the space of like two years but still that didn't last either not only did he struggle to adapt to the new country he then also had a major falling out with the manager and when it seemed his feeble career would inevitably crumble with four months left in the season goyash who by then was fighting relegation gave him a chance and he finally made the most of it pulling off 12 goals in a short period of time he got at the club flipping their form around with 13 wins in 20 matches finishing the season in ninth place which for goyash definitely qualified as success and even earned Grafite the prestigious Ball of Prata, the award given to anyone in the league's team of the season, which later on earned him a move to Sao Paulo. Finally playing for one of the country's top clubs, Grafite initially struggled to find his place, but once Luis Fabiano left the team, he finally managed to pop off, going on a run of 17 goals and 6 assists in 24 matches that allowed him to settle himself as one of the team's key players, finishing the year as their top goal scorer, then somehow managing to carry that form onto the next season, despite the fact the year started with his mother being kidnapped. Yeah. You heard that right, even more incredible, somehow while going through all of that, he also managed to earn himself a call up to the Brazilian national team on what was Romário's last ever match. It almost seemed like the writing was on the wall, like Romário was passing him the baton, but in reality, all that year had for him was even more heartbreak. One month after that match, Grafite went down with a ligament rupture and was then forced into surgery, watching from home as São Paulo made it to the final of the Libertadores without him. He would still force himself to make it back in time for the final's first leg, but if you need any proof that he wasn't at all ready to be back on the pitch, let me tell you that not only did he miss the second leg, but it took him nearly four months after the final before he played another game. Not even managing to get back in shape in time for the Club World Cup final, where he'd only managed to play for 15 minutes. Also, on that same note, though the national team had initially planned to call him up for the Confederations Cup, after that injury they decided to leave him out as well, again, watching from home as they won the tournament, adding one more reason why that year sucked for Grafite.
And so, already 27 years old and with every single one of his achievements being handicapped by some sort of tragedy, Graffito a year before was probably daydreaming of a move to a top club, ended up instead joining recently promoted Le Mans in France. But hey, his salary was 5 times higher than what they paid him in Brazil, so it wasn't all bad. Once in France, with only 3 months remaining in the season at the time of his arrival, he didn't get to do much. And the following season didn't look promising either, until the turn of the year, because right as the holiday season ended, Graffit went on a run of 8 goals in 15 matches. Which might not sound like much, but you gotta keep in mind we're talking about an era where the league's top scorer was settling for a measly 15 goals. Graffit's 12 were enough to put him on the goal scorer's podium. Actually, add that to the fact that he did it while playing for a team who up till his arrival had been relegated from the top flight at every chance they got to be on it, and you start to see why it was impressive enough to get some eyes on him. In fact, around that time, 1000 kilometers northeast of Le Mans, a revolution had started. A man named Felix Magath had arrived at Wolfsburg and having already led Bayern to two Bundesliga titles, well, let's just say he wasn't going to allow his players to settle for the mediocrity of their constant battles against relegation. So he got to work. Picking players from all across Europe, often names no one was too familiar with at the time. Josué, Ricardo Costa, Checo, Benaglio, and of course, as you might be anticipating already, Grafit. But Magath had never even heard of him. He was only scouted because some random consultant had suggested his signing, and even then the scout didn't exactly praise him too much. Magath only signed him because he was cheap and he needed some more options for the final third. And I'm not gonna lie to you, this wasn't some fairy tale story where he arrived at the club and blew everyone's mind. No. But he did manage to play most games over that first season, and by the end of it, he had managed to outscore Jekyll, who their scouts insisted was a must buy, a future world class player, a diamond in the rough. But what they didn't realize was that Grafit was a diamond as well, and despite having just turned 30, no one had actually yet attempted to shape him into his final form. Until 2008. In 2008, well, something truly special happened. By the 19th match day of the league season, despite having only managed to make 12 appearances due to a fracture and some meniscus damage, Grafit had scored 12 goals already. But despite that, Wolfsburg were only in 7th place, though that didn't stop some from believing that with some slight changes they could take things to a whole new level, as after all they were only 9 points away from the top. And of course, it was right then and there that Dzeko, who by then had only scored 5 goals in 16 matches, began firing off on all cylinders, going from being all over the place to being in complete sync with Grafit and going on an unbelievable run that saw him score 21 goals in 17 matches, which was still not enough to overtake Grafit, as he would go a step further and pull 16 goals in 13 matches over that same period, totaling out at 28 goals, two more than Dzeko, and enough to make him the league's top scorer, despite playing only 68% of the available minutes, due to his ongoing fitness problems. It was unbelievable. Look, I cannot stress this enough, these are old-timer numbers. That year, Grafit didn't just perform at a world-class level, it was one of the greatest goal-scoring seasons of all time. Averaging a goal every 74 minutes, it was only about 12% worse than either 2012 Messi or 2015 Ronaldo. Maybe their most devastating seasons ever. Oh, and if you need a more recent example, he scored at a rate that was 4% faster than Haaland this year. Yeah, you heard that 100% right. And I know, that's all very impressive, but I actually haven't even scratched the surface. Because with Jacko finally matching Grafit's numbers, Wolfsburg is the kind of form a team like them only get to experience once in a century, and began destroying everyone who came in their path, eventually leading them to a position where the top spot was for the taking under one condition. They had to beat Bayern Munich in their next match. 63 minutes into it, Wolfsburg and Bayern were tied at a one-goal draw. It looked like it would be a huge back and forth with both teams fighting for every yard hoping to get a goal, but then, 10 minutes later, Dzeko had scored two, Grafit had scored another and Wolfsburg were in front 4-1. to one. It was already a gigantic humiliation, Bayern were drowning in a sea of green, and then Grafit hit back one more time and made it all that much worse, scoring Wolfsburg's fifth goal of the match and making sure it was quite simply one of the greatest goals of all time, making a mockery of the Bayern defense 
defense, going past the keeper, and when it seemed there was no way to put the ball in the net, a back heel sealed the deal. That year, Ronaldo won the first ever Puskas award thanks to his thunderbolt against Porto. But according to Grafite, he was the one who was picked first as the winner of the award. The only reason they ended up placing him third and giving it to someone else was because someone at Wolfsburg ignored the letter they got informing them their player had won. Which meant that by the time they noticed what had happened, Grafite had already booked tickets to visit his family in Brazil, and since back then, in its first ever edition, no one could predict the Puskas would become so prestigious, Grafite simply declined the award. Yeah, if you're wondering, he does regret it. Big time. <laughs> However, the story doesn't end with that match either. The month after that, with Wolfsburg holding on to a tight lead, Magath announced he would leave at the end of the season to join Schalke. I'm gonna keep it real. This was awful timing. He could have easily broken the team's momentum and ruined their whole season, but instead, it was like the players were trying to show him what a mistake he had made, showing him he should have stayed and built a dynasty at Wolfsburg, and so they finished the season by demolishing Hoffenheim 4-0, Dortmund 3-0, Hanover 5-0 and Bremen 5-1, with only a defeat to Stuttgart in the middle of it all, you know, to keep people guessing. Oh, and by the way, across those five matches, out of the 18 goals scored, Checo and Grafite scored 16 of those. As you might imagine, by the end of it all, Wolfsburg were Bundesliga champions, two points in front of Bayern Munich. Grafite became the first ever foreign player to win the German Player of the Year award, which sounds hilarious. He also broke the record for most goals scored by a foreign player, and together with Checo, he broke an even more impressive record. The one for most goals scored by a duo in the history of the Bundesliga. And don't take this lightly, this wasn't some irrelevant record. It had been unbroken for 36 years since the legendary Gerd Müller and his partner, Holy Hones. However, I gotta take the spotlight away from those two for a second because there is someone else who always seems to go unnoticed who Checo and Grafite owe their records to. That season, Zimovic was just as, if not more impressive than them, pulling off 22 assists, something only the Bruyne and Muller have ever managed to match. So yeah, since everyone seems to forget him, I'm here to give him the praise he deserves. Regardless, as I was saying, on an international level, Grafite had become one of the hardest players in Europe. Finishing just four goals shy of prying the European golden boot from the hands of Lionel Messi, everyone was hoping to sign him. Grafite himself claims he was this close to joining Liverpool, but by the end of it all, Magath left and Grafite, Dzeko, Mzimovic and seemingly everyone else stayed. However, while Dzeko kept scoring, pulling off 30 goals the following season, Grafite's form dwindled rapidly, settling for just 19, not even being capable of getting the team to the European spots, and watching as Dzeko got a 36 million euro move to Manchester City, while the interest any club had for him faded more and more. Even though, to be fair, something peculiar happened that year, with Brazil calling him up for the World Cup. They didn't even call him up when he was at his peak, but suddenly now they thought it was the right time to do so. Yeah, it was odd. Still, Grafite would stay for a fourth season at Wolfsburg, then 32 years old, watching the team fight against relegation once more as he looked completely helpless, managing a mere 10 goals across all competitions and eventually succumbing to the temptation of securing one last paycheck and taking a move to Al Ali. After four years there, no matter how many awards he had won, not even his 63 goals in 79 matches were enough for him to hold on to any of the relevance he once had. After years of struggling for his 15 minutes of fame, Grafite had fallen into complete obscurity, and except for some German fans, the world of football had already forgotten about him. And so, struggling with those feelings, after one year at Al Sahad, Grafite moved back to the club of his heart Santa Cruz, and despite being nearly 37 by then, you could sense that he was really trying to get back that feeling of taking the world by storm. And so, despite going through seven injuries in two seasons, after managing to impress with 24 goals in a season and getting the team back to the top flight, he terminated his contract and took a move to Atlético Paranaense, his one chance at feeling that way again. But instead, all he got from that was 24 matches without a single open play goal and a truckload of criticism. The world had looked him in the face and told him to let go of his dreams. So, with his tail between his legs, he moved back to Santa Cruz, now in the second division, only for the team to get relegated to the third. He even renewed his contract, hoping to get them back up, but only 20 days later, he announced his retirement. I don't know what happened, but I do know one thing. 
He retired only six years ago, but when was the last time you heard the name Graffiti?